since tomorrow is the beginning of school, and I know some of you adults think, man, I wish I was one of those that was getting to go back to school. I'm <laughs> um, going to give you a uh, liter literary quiz here this morning, all right? Give you some first lines from literature, all right? These are the very first lines of these books. Let's see if if you can recognize maybe what book they came from. The first one is probably a real popular one. You've probably heard it. You may not know where it came from. You might. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. From? Tell Two Cities. Tell Two Cities. Cindy here teaches literature. She's going to raise her hand on every one of these, all right? <laughs> uh, by Charles Dixon. Dickens, that's right. That was probably the easiest one. This one is from a classic. Call Me Ishmael. Moby Dick. Moby Dick, you guys are good, all right. How many of you actually read Moby Dick? I had the whole thing. It's like, this is the longest story ever, you know. <laughs> I think I listened to it on a book, the audio books, actually. All right, this is from a business book. You may or may not have heard this. It's called, Good is the Enemy of Great. Anybody familiar with that? It's from a book. Carry back their nose from Jim Collins from Good to Great. And it's about businesses, why certain businesses excel and others just do okay. And the whole premise is good is the enemy of great. When we settle and not, don't try to continue forward, then that uh, gets in the way. It's not about you. Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. It was an amazing first uh, top bestseller. And it goes on and talks about the purpose of life that God has given us. All right, here's one that's a little bit harder, but I'm sure you've heard of it before. I hope I will be able to confide, confide everything in you as I have never been able to confide in anyone. And I hope you will be a great source of comfort and support. Anybody? How many of you ever heard of the Diary of Anne Frank? Okay, And then she proceeds to tell her story as a young girl in Nazi Germany during World War II. All right. Well, writers know the importance of the opening lines or the opening paragraph. A minister, hopefully, I'm aware of this, knows that the beginning of the sermon is sometimes the most important because if I, if I lose you in the first three minutes, you're going to sleep through the rest of it. All right. All right. So... First impressions are also important. You've, you've seen first impressions of people. You make first impressions. And those first impressions sometimes never change or they're very hard to change. The opening line first impressions set the tone for what's going to follow. So tell me where this opening line comes from. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Dr. <laughs> Green eggs and ham, right? All right. Oh, <laughs> Go back and do some reading there. All right. The Word of God. The opening line grabs you and sets the foundation for everything that follows. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And today I want to deal with the question, what about creation and evolution? The last few weeks have been a little intense in the, pot, the, the topics we've dealt with. Today, I just want to have some fun because I think this is a great topic and yet it's an important topic. topic. And the first thing I want to answer is what difference does it make? What does it, difference does it make? Why even deal with something like this? Well, I, I believe it's important because, number one, what you believe about creation is a reflection of how you see God in His Word. Okay? What you see and believe about creation is a reflection of God in His Word. Now, once again, as many of the things I've dealt with in this series has to do with God in His Word. That's why I started out the whole series about the Bible. I say without apology that I believe that the Word of God is the authoritative Word and it establishes the standards for mankind. And I, I won't back down from that. And uh, that's my beginning point, just so you know right up front. But what you believe about different things, one of these is creation versus evolution, is, is a reflection of where we might be on that. Also, what you believe about creation and evolution is a reflection on how you see the value of life. 
the whole uh, debate of abortion and all kinds of euthanasia and all kinds of other things that go on in this world today is a reflection of the value of life. Are we just a blob that happened to evolve and cr uh, crawl out of the primordial s s sludge and slum? And, and if that's the case, then life has very little value because we're merely a composition of organic matter that happened to come together by happen chance. Or... Is it that there's a certain design and a creator behind that? And not only that, but mankind is even distinguished from the rest of the creatures on earth. Why? Because God breathed into him the breath of life. There's something about the conscience. There's something about reasoning power. This, oh, I don't, I, that's the, whole, the, the frustrating thing about this sermon is I'm going to have all kinds of things I'm not even going to scratch the surface on. All right, But man is unique in his creation and not just simply an accident. So let me state up front a disclaimer. I'm not a scientist in this. And I don't have a science degree in things. Some of the things I share come from research and reading I've done. Some come from personal experience. But let me share just a few things about some thoughts about evolution. Now I thought it would be important to define evolution. This is my own definition. Um, this is my understanding of it. And if you look up. Uh, I actually did look up the definition and found it was very close to mine, which I was glad because I'd already made this slide. But uh, <laughs> here's how I define it. My understanding, evolution is the theory that all things, the physical universe and all life, develop gradually over millions and millions of years without a designer or creator. Okay? And I think that's, that's a good basic a beginning point when you talk about evolution. And there's some things that evolution teaches. Evolution teaches that things go from order to chaos. Now, you can approach this from a lot of different ways. Statistical probability is one of those things. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Sir Fred Hoyle, a professor of astronomy at Cambridge University, says this about probability. He says, the chance that higher forms of life might have emerged by chance is comparable to the chance that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might assemble a Boeing 747 airplane from the materials therein. The likelihood of the formation of life from inanimate matter to one is one out of ten with 40,000 zeros after it. Okay, now I could throw a bunch of statistics out there to you, but I'm a visual person, all right? You're wondering what this is all about. Here's a bag of Legos. I got up my Legos last night, dumped them out in the living room floor, and uh, I'm going to sit here and shake these. I'm going to dump them out and see what comes out. Hmm. All right. Well, let's just mix them up then. Hmm. Now, if you were a betting person, which I'm not encouraging this, all right, <laughs> would you take your money on, if I stay here for the rest of this week, 24-7, and put these in the bag, dump them out, and rearrange them, would you take your money that that's going to create something, or you're going to say that Jeff, on his limited intelligence was able to create, what is this? An airplane. Well, just to be fair, all these parts here are identical to the parts I have here. I duplicated the parts. Only this was put together by someone with limited intelligence, all right? <laughs> and yet, it came out as a design that is functional and very aesthetically pleasing, I might add, all right? <laughs> That's a very basic, simple uh, illustration. Hopefully it's good. But uh, the probability that things just collided and bumped and, and over millions of years came together is almost a statistical improbability. Well, what about laws of dynamics or laws of physics? Consider 
There's a couple of laws. There's a law called thermodynamics, all right? And that has to do with heat and energy matter in the universe. The first law of thermodynamics basically states that the amount of matter and energy in the universe never changes. All it does, it, it changes from one form to another, and energy is released or consumed in the change of that matter. Very simple illustration of water, okay? Water is in a liquid form. And it does what? It evaporates. You're not decreasing the amount of water, even though it looks like you are. All it's done, it has converted into molecules that evaporate and float into the air. All right? I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. All right, the second law of thermodynamics says this, that matter goes from order to disorder over time. In other words, matter goes from structure to chaos. That directly opposes... The evolutionary theory that states everything goes from chaos to order. There is a astronomer, a NASA astronomer by the name of Robert Jastrow, comments on this, uh, the implications of this. He says, theologians are generally delighted with the proof that the universe had a beginning, but astronomers, astronomers are curiously upset. Jastrow went on to say, for the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peaks, peaks and as he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. It seems that the cosmic egg that was the birth of our universe logically requires a cosmic chicken. In other words... What he's saying is all matter requires a creator. And evolution never addresses that, nor can it give an origin for matter. And yet, what does the first words of God in his word say? In the beginning, God what? Created the heavens and the earth. Another thing is that evolution requires that millions uh, of years took place to form the earth, to get it in our present state. Evolutionists say that the earth is millions and millions of years old. You watch all kinds of stuff on TV, things like that. You'll, that it's just stated like a fact. Well, personally, I, I don't believe the earth is millions and millions of years old. Okay? And I think there's some evidence that points that it doesn't take millions and millions of years to form some of these things that they say were formed. Two personal experiences. In 2005, Judy and I had been married 25 years. All right? That's not talking about evolution in there. Uh, that's just, that was a fact. And we went out to uh, the East Coast, or the West Coast, and went up and we stopped by Mount St. Helens, which it was also Mount St. Helens 25th anniversary. So we had a party up there, a 25th anniversary party. What was amazing, this is 25 years after the explosion of Mount St. Helens that happened in May of 1980, is you could still see the results and the destruction of that. And you get up to the peak where they don't let you go up to the peak of Mount St. Helens, but the, the next ridge over, it still then was barren land that was totally devastated and wiped out some 25 years earlier by that explosion. Now, Further, what they found uh, from that whole explosion, uh, eruption, it exploded for 15 hours with the force of one atomic bomb a second for 15 hours straight. Three days, the ash plume from that. In three days, the ash plume was depositing its ash on the east coast. And, and some places had to be shoveled like snow. Now, the evolutionary uh, theory says that it takes millions and millions of years. Lava flow. There's a portion in Yellowstone National Park where the lava flow was 27 layers thick. And they said this took, you know, millions of years for that lava flow to come over. After Mount St. Helens, they found 25 layers of different lava flow from that one eruption that took three days. There were 20,000 trees buried in uh, spirit lake there and covered instantly did not take a very long time I think it's just one example mass destruction in a very powerful way in a very short period of time that other geologists in Yellowstone said oh that took millions of years for that to happen 
Another time, Judy and I were out uh, uh, west uh, visiting um, in, outside of Missoula, Montana. St. Ignatius, Montana. There's a children's ranch there. And they took us up to the top of this mountain. And you get to the top of this mountain, and there's this sign there that says, this was the shoreline for Lake Missoula. You're thinking, whoa, because we're, I don't know, well over a thousand feet uh, up from the valley below. And the person we were with said, what happened here is this used to be a lake. This whole area used to be a lake. And something happened, and this entire lake drained and created this valley in a matter of three days. It's like, whoa. And yet, we thought, no, it takes millions and zillions of years. Well, I think the flood itself did some pretty mass. If you read the account of the flood in Genesis uh, 11, uh, to see how the earth pushed itself, waters gushed forth from the, the earth, uh, all kinds of things. Bottom line, God gave us proof and just by looking at what we've seen in our lifetimes or very recently in uh, history to show that massive change can take place in very little time frame here in this earth. So take some of that for what it's worth, but I want to spend more time on the wonder of God's creation. It's like that old adage they teach uh, someone to, create, to, to identify counterfeit bills not by looking at all the counterfeit bills, but rather by looking at the real thing. Well, let's look at some scriptures and then look at some things that I believe are related to them. The wonder of creation is a witness of design, I believe. Design is seen in nature. Romans 1.20 says this, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. Now, I've got a simple mind, so I like simple things. What kind of things show design? All kinds of things. Let's just deal with numbers and nature, okay? Even numbers. Each watermelon has an even number of stripes on the rind. Now some of you are going to run to Walmart this afternoon. And <laughs> go ahead. Count those things. Each orange has an even number of segments. Each ear of corn has an even number of rows. Each stalk of wheat has an even number of grains. Every bunch of bananas has on its lowest row an even number of bananas, and each row after that alternates one less. Odd, even, even odd, even odd. Now, I got banana plants in my backyard. A pod of bananas just dropped, so I'm going to check that out uh, here hopefully in a month or so. The waves of the sea, next time you're at the beach, the waves of the sea roll in on shore 26 to a, min a minute in all kinds of weather. Pattern. Design. Design is, is seen in nature. And you could go through all kinds of illustrations and things like that. But I'm going to go on. Design is seen in the heavens. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Time itself. We are captured by time, by this little thing on our watch, or the clock, or the calendar that we have, our date book, whatever. You know where time comes from? From observations of the heavens. The basis of time is based on the accuracy of the universe and how it works together. The circuit of the earth around the sun. The rotation of the earth. The precise timing of that. The moon going around. It's, it's based, time itself is based on God's creation. The location of the earth and the solar system is interesting. So it's very, life could not exist on earth if some of the following were true. If the earth's rotation were slower or faster. If there were a 2%, if we were 2% closer to the sun or from the sun, we'd either overheat 
or we would freeze. Life could not exist if 1% of the sunlight we get changes. The moon, we couldn't exist if the moon was larger or smaller. Why would that impact us? It would really impact us in Benita Springs because it would impact the tide charts and the moon rotates around, causes the tide. We would be underwater if the new moon was different than it is. The Earth's crust, we couldn't exist if the Earth's crust was thicker or thinner. If it's thicker, it doesn't let some of the core heat up to where we're at. If it's thinner, it will collapse. The oxygen and nitrogen ratio, if it was greater or smaller, we'd be dead. Because we need 21% oxygen in our atmosphere to consistently live. And then all of that works together. All the plants take in, this is basic science 101, plants take in what? Carbon dioxide. And it breathes out? Oxygen. The plants depend on us to breathe, and we depend on the plants to breathe. Very delicate system. But without it, we wouldn't exist. Listen to Isaiah 40. It says, To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift your eyes and look to the heavens who created all these. Who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. And you can get into the study of the, the universe. It's amazing. The whole universe contains over 100 billion galaxies. And every galaxy is millions of miles wide and contains billions of stars. Get on YouTube, look up Louis Giglio uh, creation. And he's got some amazing videos on that. And uh, don't have time to go on all that today. But the heavens declare the glory of God. Design is also seen in its balance. The balance of creation. Colossians 1 says, For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and here it comes, and in him all things hold together. Now you may know, you may not know, that one quarter of the earth's surface is covered by land, and three quarters of the earth is covered by water. Therefore, man should spend at least three-fourths of his time fishing, right? All right. Oh, wait a minute. That wasn't the point I was going to make. All right. The point is this, is that that dry land needs to be watered. It needs to be nourished. It needs to have all this. If the land mass was twice of what it is, it would cut the water mass down, say it was 50-50. That would cut the water mass output by evaporation down to uh, 25%. Make a long story short, if those things changed, then life would cease to exist because the balance of evaporation and distribution and rain and watering would be knocked out of kelter and we would all dry up and shrivel away. All right? Balance is amazing how God brought us together. Design is seen in mankind. Psalm 139. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know that full well. The DNA molecules, that little ribbon of uh, you, you might have seen pictures of. I should have put a picture up there, but I didn't. The DNA molecule is maybe one of the greatest discoveries of man in the last century. Because through the DNA molecule, they have found the blueprint for life, literally. You've heard of DNA matches in criminology. has, has totally converted the way criminologists do their job because of the DNA molecule and the accuracy and the design that can be taken from DNA samples because you have DNA that can be matched by no one else in this entire world. Because inside you, you have a bunch of DNA molecules that are one of the most amazing molecules. It contains so much information. Uh, you could store on the pinhead. 
You seen those little pins that have the little ball on the end of it? A DNA molecule that size would contain enough information to fill books. If you were to stack them to the moon, which is 240,000 miles, it would do that 500 times. That's how much information you could get out of DNA the size of a pinhead. And we all start out as a cell about the size of a period on the end of a sentence. And yet we grow into a body with 100 trillion cells that all function together. And that's done through what? The DNA molecule at conception. Because in that little pinhead, the DNA tells everything how it goes together. Wow. So when we think about creation... And we think we've got it all figured out. I want us to never forget about our purpose. Isaiah 42.5 says, This is what God the Lord says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. You're not a blob. You're designed with a purpose by a creator that sees meaning and significance and purpose in your life. And when we get to the point where we think I don't know if I buy all of that. I think, I think man's got it all figured out. I want you to do this. To sit back and listen. Job. The end of the book of Job. Chapters 38, 39, 40, 41. I'm only going to read 30 verses. All through the book. Job's friends have been telling Job, Job, God's like this, God's like this. And they have all this big long conversation. And finally, God breaks in and says, excuse me. And I want to read and just close with these words. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. And he said, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man and I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Who shut up the sea behind the doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness? And when I fixed the limits for it and set it do its doors and bars in place? And when I said, this far you may come and no further, here's where your proud waves halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? The earth takes shape like clay under a seal, and its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light, and their unpraised arm is broken. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea, or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. What is the way to the abode of light? And where does the darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths of the dwellings? Surely you know, for you are already born. You have lived so many years. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hail, which I reserve for times of trouble, for days of war and battle? What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed? Or to the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? Or who cuts the channel for the torrents of rain and the path for the thunderstorm? To water or land where no man lives, a desert where no man is in it. To satisfy, to satisfy a desolate wasteland and make it sprout with grass. Does the rain have a father? Who fathers the drops of dew? From whom, wo from whom womb comes the ice? 
Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens, and when the waters become as hard as stone, when the surface of the deep is frozen? And it goes on like that for three chapters. And then it concludes this way. This is Job speaking. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. And Job says, my ears had heard about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Let us open our eyes and see the God of creation. Let's pray.